Welcome everyone to another episode of Friday PM. Thank you so much for joining us yet again. For our faithful viewers, welcome back. And can we just thank you so much for your, all your encouragement. So many people have encouraged us writing in or just phoning in or saying how much they have been blessed. So we give all the glory back to the Lord. But thank you. So welcome back. And for anyone watching us for the very first time, well, you're especially welcome too. And we hope that you'll catch up with all the other episodes that you might have missed and that you'll be able to join us going forward. Well, today I'm very blessed and honored uh, to have a very dear friend and fellow soldier in the army of the Lord, a fellow minister of the gospel here with me, actually in the studio. So Tim, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. It's an honor to be here and I'm actually more blessed, I think, than you to be here. Oh, well, it's, it's a photo finish. I mean, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> well, bless you. Just tell our viewers a little bit. Um, pastor Tim is the pastor of New Life Church. And it's, is it in Hampton? Itself? In Hampton, yeah. In Hampton. Uh, what part of London? No, it's, south. it's just not far from Richmond. So okay. Richmond area, but just outside Richmond. You've got Hampton. All right. Uh, Sunbury. Cool. Kingston. So if you're anywhere near those areas, this is a wonderful church. I have it on good authority to say it's a very blessed church, wonderful church. And even if you know someone that's in that area, perhaps uh, you can let them go and stop by. Um, Tim is, of course, married to, to Pastor Sandra, and uh, they've got two children, Luke and Zoe. Zoe. And uh, we were just saying that they're not so, so old, uh, so, so young, so young anymore. <laughs> so they're growing up quickly. Uh, but they've got two lovely children. And of course, Sandra is a great blessing as well. And uh, actually, Rachel and I are also very blessed to be on, your, on the board of New Life Church. You are. And uh, <laughs> it's an honor to have you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a great, uh, great to have your wisdom and spiritual input too. Well, praise the Lord for that. Uh, so, yeah, a great church indeed. And Tim, I just love it that the church is so mixed as well. That's what when we ministered there... Uh, and, Oh, not all that long ago. Just lovely to see the mixture of different age, uh, uh, different ethnical groups, different age groups. Uh, I find it so refreshing. It's a, just, it just even, it just looks right. Yeah. So well, great that you guys do that. That was the Lord again. I mean, uh, everything in our church, really, I would put down to it's, it's, it's Him that does it. And right at the very beginning, I, I'm not a worship. Uh, leader as such and not musical. My daughter is, but I'm not and neither is Sandra. So um, we were reliant on the Lord to provide our worship leader. And our first wor worship leader that came, came from Kent, from Folkestone, and would drive 200 miles round trip every Sunday afternoon, because we had a four o'clock service, to lead worship for us. And Deslin and Flory, um, from Life Church, which is interesting, which is a mega church in Kent under Pastor Miles Buck, uh, Robert Miles Buck, mm -hmm. who's become a great friend now. And uh, from that, Deslin's very musical, and he said that we must set the music to, if we want a multicultural church, which is what I wanted. I wouldn't want a, a church of all white people or black people or I wanted a mixture, and it's interesting. We have a lot of people from mixed marriages, black and white, nice. uh, which is wonderful. And we mm -hmm. still have a French connection. We have quite a few French people, French-speaking people, you know, from the Congo, from Kuala Loop, Bordeaux, um, which is great. So it is a really big mixture of people. Fantastic. And uh, Tim, we were so encouraged by the church, and I do admire your faith because you were just saying earlier, maybe I'll let you explain that, you know, we have to adhere to the law. Which, which you did to the T, but then we have to make the maximum of what the Lord will allow us to do as well. And you guys have done just that. Well, I'm very blessed because I, I put that all really down to Sandra because she's a really detailed person. She, um, ex-bank manager, she dots all the I's, the T's, make sure everything is correct. So every Friday, she'll get the government guidelines go down them looking at what the shoulds should be and what the musts m must be. And the shoulds you have to mitigate against and the musts are legal requirements. And, and then I would be like the Boris Johnson side of things. I'll be going, yeah, but he said common sense. 
apply common <laughs> sense, you know. And we'd have these sort of battles where she was going, no, this is the legal thing. You must do this. And I said, well, what about this is a should? So we don't have to know. We have to mitigate against that. So on the day of lockdown, the very first lockdown, God moved us into a new building that was massive. Mm. It would seat 250 people. And we're not a, a mega church of that size, but it enabled us to put the spacing in. So we could have that two meter spacing between rows and between families. Um, the other thing we found is that there was nothing that said you couldn't sing, must not sing, so, but you do have to wear a mask. So again, it's just common sense that putting a mask on when you sing um, is no difference from talking, really. If the mask is going to stop any projectiles, it'll do that. So in our church, you can come, you can sing, a bit with a mask on, and we have managed to stay open all but the first first lockdown. Mm, fantastic, fantastic. And Tim, funny enough, you reminded me that this week is actually Mental Health Week. Yeah, I, I was reading this morning, there was a lot of stuff on the news saying that actually after the third lockdown, I think it was, one in five people suffer mental health issues, which is colossal, one in five. Wow. And so, I mean, as many have seen on the title, I mean, we are going to talk about mental health today. And yeah. um, it's pretty kind of natural how it came really on your plate where you had to maybe dig a little deeper, maybe than the average person where you knew that you know, God's using you to, to, to meet the need here and to minister into someone who might have a, a health issue and, and are really struggling uh, mentally. Mm -hmm. So maybe tell me, how, how, did it, how did it come about where you, you looked into this? I think as a, as a, as a pastor, and, and before I was a pastor, I was an electronic design engineer and I used to run my own consultancy. So I'm used to fixing things and making things. And being a pastor, you, you kind of want to help fix people. So there's a natural tendency to care in that, in that way and fix people. But that can also be detrimental because you know, I can get dragged in too much sometimes. But I prefer it that way round. But the way this all came about was Sandra had a, a vision. She was with the Lord and she saw uh, a, a, a man totally black, like they'd been burnt, in fact, they had no real face, it was just a figure sitting on a mantelpiece with a fire beneath. And she thought, oh my goodness, this person's been burnt mm. by the fire. And then she suddenly saw him topple over the edge. And then she looked and beside the fire, the man was standing or this, this figure was standing, but they were completely white as though they'd been completely restored. And that was the beginning she felt to encourage me that God is going to use me to bring about healing, particularly in people on the edge. Mm. And was there a particular person then that, that kind of ignited this? Was there someone initially that, or, or had, well, that was the first person that you realized that this is real, we had to, to start dealing with it? And, uh, well, before that, I'd been looking at things about the mind and studying up and trying to understand myself, what makes me tick and what makes other people tick. Um, mind, body and soul and spirit and all of that stuff. Mm. I just want to go deeper, you know, and I felt the Lord encouraging me that way. But then then we got a, a message on the email to say a visitor was coming and he had mental health issues. And then I had another email come through from uh, someone who had a brother um, who was near in, in Hampton. And would I go and visit him? He was in a, in a, in a sheltered home. So this to me was all confirmation that this was happening. And then there were a number of other people after that that had mental issues that um, I was finding out about in the congregation that I was looking at trying to find ways to help them recover. So again, it's each step the Lord kept encouraging me to take further steps. Tim, is it something that you, can I say, identify in someone where you ask a question or whether is it someone that asks for help themselves? I think this is a real key issue. You, you can never help somebody unless they want to be helped. You know, I look at Jesus at beside her. There was one man on a mat who he restored fully, but there were plenty other people around there who were sick. 
but none of them asked him for help. So I think you can, you know, the old saying, you can take a, a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, is so true. The person has to want to get out of that mental mess that they're in. Um, and they, they need to reach out for help. If not, there's very little you can do for anybody with any sickness of any kind. If they don't really want help and they're happy to accept it the way it is, then there's nothing you can do. Then how can I ask the question? I mean, how, how does someone, you know, you said you studied a little bit, which is great. And I think it'll help anyone that's watching, um, whether it's for ourselves, kind of gauging where you at or whether it's maybe in a position to help someone else. But let's just say, how do I know that basically I need help? What are, are they kind of orange or red lights? What, <laughs> when do you know that you know? <laughs> Often it's, it's difficult because it creeps up on you without you being aware. And uh, there are warning signs that you can look for. For instance, is your body all tense? Are you having trouble sleeping? Um, do you avoid people? Do you avoid putting off making phone calls to people? Um, are you isolating yourself? All of those things can be signs of something there, a warning sign um, for you to try and sort these things out. And if you ignore them, they can build and build. Or if you suppress them, if you think emotions suppressed is depression, depressed oh. emotions. So if you just suppress them, eventually emotions will come out and they can come out in various ways. And if you have a meltdown, it can be disastrous. Everything can fall apart. Mm. Um, and if you remember, I think it was Job, what he feared came upon him. And so the fear that you develop then comes upon you and all the things that you f were frightened of actually does materialize because you're powerless to, to stop that fear from going on and on and on. And it sort of like burns a track in your mind and your brain effectively. And then, you know, the enemy's not sitting there being quiet. He then blows on that fire to oh, just yeah. give it more. Oh yeah, it, once you've it got intense. you, if you can get the person to a total negative state, then the devil comes and just starts feeding more and more to get the person to lose all hope. And if they get them to lose all hope, then there's no point in living. And it's a numbness comes. And that's very easy then to take one's life. So it's vital to get to people before they get to that stage. And yeah, the devil's always active in thoughts and putting ideas in people's heads, mm. you know, and triggers. Triggers. Uh, Tim, something that you and I spoke uh, earlier is also to kind of to kind of hear yourself speak. You were saying you asked someone about, you know, positive, negative. Do I speak positive? Do I think positive? Do I think negative? Maybe that's something that's also a bit of a trigger to find out how, what am I speaking? How many positives am I saying? And how many negative or how quickly a positive or negative comes? And you were, you were sharing about that too. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a really interesting. This is a little piece of the puzzle that sort of went in the other week, you know, um, all of this is like a puzzle I'm putting together, making the picture and everyone is different. And, it, and, and the danger is you can't have a process just for one person because we're all individual and not everything works would work for you that might work for me. And you have to find out what works for you and adapt it for each individual. But genuinely, we are positive beings. We are wired for love. We are. And, and if you weren't, you'd see the world get more and more negative, more and more destructive. And people will argue the world's getting worse. It's not. There's still this sense that good prevails. Love is something people aspire to. Justice is something people reach out for and they desire. It doesn't destroy everything. Um, but if, if we were totally negative, it would. So. Just like the liver, if you, if you consume some alcohol, there's alcohol in your bloodstream, the liver goes into action to remove the alcohol out of your bloodstream. The brain does various processes to remove negativity out of the brain. So you're processing away at night and during the day, getting rid of negative thoughts, 
what I call housekeeping, putting them in the right places, mm -hmm. trying to make sense of the situation to balance a reality. And when you go out of balance, it, it, you can just go so negative, you can't see anything positive at all. And it's trying to restore that balance where you fear is not is what I call is false evidence about reality. It's not true, but it feels true. And that's the problem. And then the more it develops the negativity, because it shouldn't be there, your brain focuses more on the negative. That's why we don't have positive newspapers. Because we read negative newspapers because it shouldn't be there. And it's almost like you want to get rid of all of this negativity. And so negativity is almost an attractive thing because it shouldn't be there. It's something you want to get rid of, push away. Mm. I'm always amazed. It's funny you mention that. I always, sometimes when you read the, uh, the newspaper, then you always look for that one little section. It's almost, it's normally in the middle somewhere in a little column and, you know, a little kitten being born somewhere or a cat being rescued or something. The good news, <laughs> it's always in small print yes. in a very insignificant part of the paper. But it's a daily battle, isn't it, Tim, uh, uh, to, to know where I'm at. Um, but I think very important that you said about calling for help because, you know, someone might say, well, I'm, I don't think I'm very bad as far as mental health. But when do you know that you really need to call for help? I think, as I said, when you start withdrawing from people and you don't want to be around people, um, everything gets difficult, trouble sleeping. Um, and I know in lockdown, particularly, people's routines go out the windows. You know, you, you can start staying up later and later because you haven't got to get up so early. Routines throws you out of balance. Yeah. You know, that, that's yeah. the great thing about church. You have to get up early on a Sunday to come to church. It, mm -hmm clicks the routine back in. So the cruelest thing of this pandemic was really saying you can't come to church. There's nothing to reset the routine. Because I think many people that we've heard, and I'm sure you've spoken to people too, it's to get that balance between adapting. Many people have now adapted. So now I'm adapting, let's say, working from home, for example. Um, mothers that are now able to having to dovetail being, you know, having a professional career plus being more at home with the children and and in those kind of situations but maybe you know also for people who are single or, or maybe be in a different situation that it's so it's good to learn to be happy with your own company they say you know I suppose you must learn that be happy with yourself they say be happy with your own company which is good but not to withdraw and I think that's something that you that you say that you're not to not to withdraw from from social interaction and, and, and especially fellowship. Yeah, and watch the negativity. If you see negativity as a virus, something that's to be eradicated, and it's a really good thing, I think, for people to process in their minds is, this is a negative comment. I mean, I'm, I'm really blessed. Sandra picks me up every time if I say something negative. She just comes in and says, that's negative. And I, it makes me think, what am I saying? And I try and revert that into something creative and positive, which is love talk. God is positive. He's, he's love. He's light. Yeah. He's not destruction and doom and gloom. No, no, of course. And then, of course, of course, looking to the to the word, there's so much that can that can encourage us and it can inspire us uh, to get past this. I think one of the things you've mentioned are three three different. Uh, what is it? One is. I don't know if you want to delve into that or, or share some of the scripture that you've had because you got you did some great research. So feel free to to share from something uh, that's that's on your heart. Well, I suppose right from the Garden of Eden, that was one of the key things that they they spoke out. They were afraid. So when they came into knowledge of good and evil, they became fearful, and fear is very destructive. It 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 stops you doing what you want to do, and this is why I mean Jesus is such a wonderful saviour because it's all about being who he's called you to be. It's discovering the real self and the real self can do lots of things but fear inhibits you. It stops you doing things. Mm. You know I love it when someone comes in and they're full you know not confident they you know and we get them doing stuff that are outside their comfort zone and we just see them grow and and their, their fear gets less and less but when fear comes into the present that's when you deal with it and sometimes it's just it's it's I call it living in the present 
The devil wants you in the past or the future, because in either of those two places, you can't change anything. Mm -hmm. If you're always Very good. in the past, you're worrying about, you're, I can never be anybody because of this happened to me. And if you're in the future, you're never going to do anything because this might happen. But if you're in the present and you're living in the present, you change things. And it's the same in the mind and the brain, you change things in the present. Mm -hmm. You weaken the fear when you bring it from, if it's something subconscious, a trauma, it could be the mm -hmm. uh, relationship, it could be anything, abuse. But when it's in the present, you then can process it properly mm -hmm. and uh, see it for what it really is. I think that's excellent. Um, very good because I mean, it does line up with Scripture so much. The Bible says, forget what's behind. Apostle Paul says, forget what's behind. In other words, you can't do, you can't do jack about yesterday. We wish we could sometimes, if I had yesterday over, I, I wanted to change one or two things, but that's gone. Well, look at Paul. Can't change about, can't, can't do anything about yesterday. No, well, look at Paul. He killed people. And then he was preaching to the parents and sometimes the children of parents he may have had stoned to death. Yeah. How did he do that? He had to let go of the past. Yeah. You know? Um, I think Rachel said something in, in the prayer that just really touched me, reminded me that the woman caught in adultery. You know, again, the fear, the shame, the guilt. And first of all, Jesus turned it round to get rid of all the accusers. Having got rid of all those accusing voices and people, he then just turned around those lovely words, does no one condemn you? Then neither do I. Mm. And that's our God. He doesn't condemn you. He's trying to pull you up and restore you. And, and the way he does that is through his love. So he loves you first. So it's love. God loves you. You love God. And out of that, you then de develop a love for yourself and develop the love character within you. And then you love people. Mm. And it starts in that order. Yeah. And too many people are trying to do it the wrong order. You've got to allow God to love you first. Wow. You also mentioned something about not thinking about yourself. Uh, it's about being grateful. That's one of the keys that you yeah. that, that you found. I've got. I mean, there's several. I mean, uh, scriptures that I was just thinking about. Um, um, Philippines four six to seven classic one. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So one of the keys, I really believe, for stopping oneself going negative is thanksgiving. When we were teaching Bible school, the first thing we used to say every, you know, in fact, we still do it. Every Bible school um, session, we'd have two sessions in an evening. Start of each session, we say, give me three reasons to praise the Lord and write them down in the book. And then the next session, give me three different reasons to thank the Lord. And we do that every session. So at the end of Bible college, they have a book full of reasons to thank God for. And I say, do that so in the hard times, because it's the valleys you grow in, never on the hilltops. It's the valleys where you really grow. You open that book and you find the reasons to start to give thanks. And if you're going through a place, I would say, I spoke to someone the other day and I said, give me eight reasons why you're fearful. No problem at all. Bam. <laughs> do, you, do you only want eight? <laughs> you only want eight? Yeah. I said, give me one reason to give thanks to the Lord? Nothing. So I said the medicine is Psalm 136. Read through. Psalm 130 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. You see, this there straight away. Tell me to give Lord thanks for he's good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. He's the God. He's bigger than this. And if you work through this, there's always something there. You could draw from that psalm to give thanks to God, however tough that situation you're facing. And you know, you go through the valleys and everyone loves the hilltops, but you know, you don't grow anything above 2000 feet, nothing grows on the mountains. They're great experiences, but they are experiences. It's those tough times that you have to rely on the Lord. It's when he carries you. That's when you start to really grow 
and depend on him and develop the mind of Christ. Tim, um, when you say, uh, you said before, you know, different, different signs that you look at, let's say, um, you know, negative signs or, or when, when, when we need the help. And we started by saying that number one thing is to call for help. And someone once, I don't know who, if it was anonymous, but someone said, God loves helping people who are willing to help themselves. Now, I don't think you can find it in Scripture anyway, but I believe there's a matter of truth to that, is where you have to say, Lord, I need help. And to take the initial steps to turn the tide, because mentally, you know, it's almost like someone's going in one direction. You're going in a negative direction. You're thinking in one direction. All your thoughts, one feeds off the next, as we said. You're just going in one direction. Nothing counteracts or you don't count to speak where, you, where you're where headed. It's all negative. So maybe uh, before we end our time, uh, perhaps if you can uh, pray for someone today, it's, it's just to say that it's important to call for help. And that's, that's why fellowship is so important, isn't it? to have someone to be accountable to. So the initial step, let's say if someone's watching and you, you're going through something negative, the first thing is to call for help and to have someone that they can turn to for prayer. Well, the first thing I would say is, is before you ask help from anybody, make sure it's someone you trust. You know, hopefully you trust your pastor or your vicar or your minister um, or your doctor or someone close to you but don't share with someone who, who, who tends to gossip or, or, or spread lots of things so it, it really and I and our church is always on a need to know basis always it often it's well all the time it stops with us we don't share about people um, without their consent so I think it's very, that's the first thing is to knowing who to trust with okay. it so once you've established that the next battle to overcome is the shame because, well, I'm the only one who has this problem. Everyone else's marriage is perfect, but my marriage is not very good. I mean, I'm gambling and everyone, no one else gambles. It's just me, but I can't stop. Or it's drinking. You know, I'm having those secret drinks all the time and it's just got out of control. I don't want to admit that because to admit that I'm a failure. I'm actually ashamed of what I, where I'm, where I'm at. I'm ashamed of what I'm doing. Um, and again, it comes back to that woman caught in adultery again. You know how Jesus doesn't condemn you. And honestly, when you ask for help, people actually want to help you. They really do. And it's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. We all get in messes. And I, I tell you, as a pastor. Most people suffer an awful lot of similar things, just to different degrees. But we all go through the mill at different times. It's part of that sanctification process that we all go through of being restored and renewed. Um, so don't think you're alone. That is the biggest lie of the devil. Mm. And, and don't be frightened of asking for help. You might be greatly surprised at how understanding your pastor might be. Um, and uncondemning he will be. Wow, and also maybe pointing you to someone who can help. We have a saying in our ministry that if, if whoever is leading and is a spiritual leader cannot help you, I might not be able to help you, but I can always point you to someone who will. Um, Tim, at this place, why don't, we, why don't we pray together? If you can just lead us in a prayer, uh, just praying for someone who've, who's been battling. And you know, uh, uh, Joyce Meyer wrote a book called Battlefield of the Mind and it's up here where some people if you can see what's happening in there it's like a, it's like a war zone and it's so tiring mm. and I know there could be someone watching that it's just so tired mentally you feel well how long can I still last in this battle so why don't you pray because I believe God wants to touch someone right now during your prayer okay so the first thing to understand, to get us a quick understanding, is that when your brain is on overload, it's because you're trying to sort and make sense out of. But it says here to give thanks. It says, um, let me just read that, just, just recap that uh, scripture I, I read on Philippines. 
it says um, the peace of God which transcends understanding. That's what you need to get through it. So I'm going to pray now. Father, I pray for those that are going through the mill, those that are struggling with addictions, those that are, are, are fighting the battle, Lord, and feel they're losing. Father, I thank you that your word says we are overcomers. And Father, I thank you that to overcome means to overcome something. And Father, I thank you that if we reach out to you, you will give us that help. If we reach out to the body, someone out there in the body of Christ or a trusted friend, a doctor, they're on the same side. They will guide me to the right place. Father, I pray for those in that anxiety, that pain, that emotional turmoil in their minds, that are tired, that are worn out. Father, I pray right now that as they reach out, they can receive your peace that transcends all understanding, that you'll quieten their minds so they can think clearly, give them a deep, refreshing sleep. And we break any of those chains that are holding them down in Jesus' name. Yes. It's the name that breaks the chain in Jesus' name. And we come against spirits of gambling, alcohol, sexual or, marit uh, sexual or marital problems. Father, we put them all under the blood of Jesus. We thank you that you restore them. Give them the confidence. Take away that shame, that guilt to seek the help they need and deserve as a child of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Tim, thank you so much for that prayer. Praise the Lord. I know someone out there has been really, really touched today by what you shared. Thanks so much again. And our time just ran, ran out so quickly. Tim, before you go, please tell us a bit just about your church quickly. We mentioned that at Tim's church, if you weren't there in the beginning, it's called New Life Church in Hampton. Yes. Um, www.newlifechurch.life Great. And, uh, do have a, have a look. And uh, our service times are 10.30 on a Sunday. You're always welcome. So uh, look forward to seeing someone, someone there. And uh, Tim, you've also got some, I've been encouraged also by your, you've got some online material. Is that on the website or on YouTube, yeah. some of your sermons? You, and you'll find uh, all, all the sermons if you want to get a taste of what it's like. Um, have a look at uh, on the website, you'll find a link to YouTube, but on YouTube, if you look at uh, New Life Church Hampton or Pastor Tim Boyer, you will find me there. Great. Bless you, Tim. Well, listen, I, we didn't get even through, I, know. I, I think, half of what, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll have to talk about this some more because it's such an important subject. So we'll, we'll see how we go on that one, but I think it'll be great for you to come back and maybe share some more. And uh, so... Thank you again so much for coming today, for making the effort. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Okay, bless you. Thank you. So great. Thank you for watching, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully, you can join us again next week on Friday p.m. It's the place to be. God bless you. Bye-bye. And it's bye for me. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>